Okay, so yeah, I'm super excited to be here uh, and share our um, recent research about neurosymbolic common sense reasoning. Um, so uh, part of the goal of this talk will be to address some of the frequently asked questions these days that NLP or common sense or whatever, it looks like almost solved by chat GPT and I have an existential crisis. So uh, people do ask me, this from time to time. Um, so perhaps um, it's a case of a hasty generalization, especially if we do look at um, some of the examples. So the trophy doesn't fit in the brown suitcase because it's too big. What's too big? So this is classical uh, Winograd schema challenge problem. Um, and here, ChatGPT answers it correctly, that trophy is too big. So impressive. But what if you change the question a little bit? Then it says the trophy itself is too small to fit into the suitcase. So it's not very reliable at the moment. Um, so the situation is a little bit like David and Goliath in the sense that um, the bigger appears to be better uh, in many of the cases. Although, of course, some of the more careful studies do reveal that uh, smaller models can be better with better data or better uh, uh uh, reinforcement to learning with the human feed feedback and whatnot. So uh, it's likely that there are still uh, other ways to improve the transformer performances uh, by building smaller models in a more um, clever way. So uh, one way to draw the uh, insight is from this classic uh, book known as The Art of War, uh, which of course says nothing about deep neural networks or transformers, but the wisdom here is that know your enemy, choose your battles, and innovate your weapons, which we can translate that as um, uh, evaluation with realism and scrutiny and uh, uh, focusing on uh, uh, different types of new tasks and leaderboards and then innovating your algorithms and data. So in this talk, I'm going to showcase three such studies. And let's dive right in uh, with my prompting. Uh, by the way, so the recurring theme in this talk will be that smaller models can be better and the knowledge is power. So uh, let's start with this observation that language models are sometimes amazing. So if you ask GPT-3, if you travel west far enough from the west coast, you will reach to the east coast or not? So uh, it says the world is around, which is correct. So you will reach the East Coast eventually. Therefore, the answer is true. So this looks impressive, um, except when it's not impressive. So if you ask other questions like butterflies fly with the three wings or not, uh, it says it has a four wings. Therefore, the statement is a false. But if you read back what it just said, as true false questions, then it negates what it just said. So it can be inconsistent with uh, its own statement. And then there are many other such uh, inconsistency problems. So it's not clear what language models do or do not know. It's almost like language models are some sort of lemons. Well, it might be cherries if you only pick cherries, but um, it doesn't make strange mistakes. So the question is, how do we make better lemonade from GPT-3. Uh, so one approach might be to get philosophical and use Socrates' myuric method that was originally developed for addressing humans' flawed reasoning, because it actually turns out even humans are not all that logically consistent, let alone GPT-3. So um, the way it works is this, we're gonna build the myuric inference tree uh, and let's use the uh, previous example as a running example. So what we do is we ask the following question, providing the answer being true, and then let uh, uh, attach because, so that we prompt GPT-3 to continue on this uh, sentence, which means it will now have to explain, provide explanation why the answer is true. In this case, uh, the explanation is good. So we, it's E of T, explanation of the answer being T. Uh, we ask the same question, uh, switching out true with the false, and then see what uh, BS GPT-3 might come up with. So here, it's just trying to uh, go with the false as an answer, but it just doesn't have a very good answer. It just says you cannot reach. 
So now we call this as E of F. So it's explanation of F, answer being F. Um, now let's see how robust or consistent GPT-3 is with respect to its own explanations. So uh, we read back E of T and then let GPT-3 to decide whether it's going to agree or disagree with a label true or false. So in this case, uh, the last one is negated version of E of T. So we insert negation not here. And in this case, it's good that it's a flipping the answer when the statement is negated. So this is a case when GPT-3 is logically integral to E of T. For E of false, though, which was basically a bogus explanation for the wrong answer, uh, it's not able to flip its own uh, labeling, which means uh, GPT-3 is not logically integral. So um, that's good. GPT-3 does know something strange about its own explanation given previously. And so we can keep doing this recursively uh, to let... Uh, to make GPT-3 to explain its own explanation of explanation recursively. So we build this myuric tree uh, or graph um, for some time, and then only keep uh, branches that are logically integral, throwing out the non-integral part for now. But even after chopping the branches where there's logical inconsistencies, um, GPT-3 being GPT-3, the tree will still have some inconsistent explanations. So in order to uh, improve the logical consistency, now what we do is we're going to look at uh, pairwise consistency among any of the nodes. So we compute, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, stepping back, we're going to first um, compute the node-wise con uh, confidence. So we call that as a belief. And it's defined by this particular uh, equation that basically looks at different conditional probabilities and then compute its ratio uh, to, to see how confident it is for any particular node. We then also look at the edgewise uh, or pairwise consistency by uh, using off-the-shelf natural language inference models output, whether uh, a pair um, is contradiction or not. So we then uh, create this pairwise weights. Now, once you have all of this, then we can formulate a constrained optimization problem where the uh, inference objective is to assign some label, either true or false, on each of the nodes such that it's going to maximize the weight assigned to all of these nodes and edges. So sometimes um, the labeling will have to flip the original label uh, that the model might have a prefer to give because that way you can um, enhance the graph level consistency. So you can solve this with any uh, max set. So set means uh, satisfiability. Um, and this is a classical AI search algorithm. And uh, we used uh, this particular solver, but you can use many others. And um, uh, so here, the final output is that the original answer to the original question should be true. And then it also gives you node-wise, uh, per node uh, label assignment as well. So what does this mean in the end, in terms of empirical result? So when tested on common sense QA 2.0, um, the canonical prompting, so green, used on top of GPT-3, so it's a basically fuchsia prompting on GPT-3, will give you a bit better than chance performance. So this is true-false uh, QA data set, so your chance level is 50, and GPT-3 is barely better than chance. Uh, but recently, there have been some uh, ideas such as chain of thoughts or self-consistency that can improve the vanilla prompting method considerably. So if you use such variations, then you get performance gain. Now, the purple is the uh, uh, different variant of it, but together 
they're all doing worse than myuric prompting, which in fact uh, does better than supervised model trained on T5. Uh, usually supervised model trained on T5 is hard to beat uh, using GPT-3 few shot, uh, but uh, basically this is inference time only algorithm, practically unsupervised, and it does well on that. And similarly, we see a uh, large boost when tested on uh, other common sense benchmarks such as CRIC or come to sense So what this tells us is that um, although uh, the emergent capabilities of large transformers are phenomenal, uh, they can be um, not very robust for some of these common sense challenges. And it's in large part due to the logical inconsistencies, which can be dramatically enhanced when you do this sort of symbolic reasoning on top. Uh, so yeah, not only Socrates' method helped with flawed human reasoning, it can also dramatically enhance the flawed neural networks reasoning. Okay, so uh, moving to the next topic, symbolic knowledge distillation. So this work is a work that tries to convert general language models on top of transformers to causal common sense models, also transformers. And the reason why we might want to worry about common sense models uh, is because despite uh, human level or even superhuman level performances on a variety of leaderboards, the state-of-the-art models are brittle when given adversarial or out-of-domain examples. So uh, transformers uh, can make seemingly uh, strange mistakes. Uh, and so solving, it's almost like solving only a data set without really solving the underlying task. And um, this phenomenon sometimes is described as a systematic generalization problem. And why does this happen is that Unlike humans who truly learn about how the world works conceptually, uh, transformers learn sort of a surface patterns in language or images that are powerful for many downstream use cases, but still not um, really robust understanding of the concepts and how the world works. So in order to bridge this gap, we can really think about this challenge of learning acquiring common sense capabilities uh, for machines. So the operational definition of a common sense uh, in this talk will be that it's the basic level of a practical knowledge and reasoning concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared among the most people. This is really important, the last part, that it's commonly shared among the most people, but it's not the case that it's shared by everybody in the universe. Uh, because the additional context can always uh, change what is uh, commonsensical for any given culture or situation. So, for example, in general, uh, you and I probably agree that it's okay to keep the closet door open, but it's not okay to keep the fridge door open because the food inside might go bad. So these are general rules of thumb so that we might uh, uh, abide by. But, you know, of course, if you go to your friend's house, you might behave a little bit and, you know, keep their closet doors open, uh, sorry, uh, closed. Uh, and then as far as the fridge door, if you're in a store and it's not really uh, hooked up to the wall, then it doesn't matter when wh wh whether the fridge door is open or not because the, there's no food inside. And, it, you know, you can come up with in many situations in which um, these basic rules of the thumbs will have exceptions. So, that is uh, the key uh, challenge of common sense because uh, not uh, it's not universal knowledge, but it's sort of like shared across a um, large uh, population of people. Okay, so it's essential. Such common sense is essential for humans to live and interact with each other in a reasonable and safe way. And so as AI becomes uh, increasingly more uh, important aspect of human lives, and with ChatGPT, more likely so, uh, it's good if AI can understand human needs and actions and values better. So uh, the premise of this talk is that language models are not equivalent to knowledge models, even though language models today 
do acquire a great deal of knowledge, but they're not equivalent. So um, we developed um, symbolic common sense knowledge graph known as Atomic uh, a few years ago, four years ago now, um, as well as neural common sense uh, model built on top of or trained uh, using Atomic as the source of training, fine-tuning of off-the-shelf language models. Um, up until two years ago, this Atomic was fully crowdsourced by humans, uh, which in this talk, uh, I'm going to lift, but um, at first, the norm is that this all has to be human um, crowdsourced. So you can consider almost atomic as a human demonstration in the current version of you know chat gpt you can consider this as human demonstrations of common sense inferences uh, and we had this comet atomic 2020 which is enhanced version of atomic and the comet again atomic portion was fully crowdsourced by humans in 2021 so let me give you a bit of a um, uh, sample of what atomic 2020 looks like so imagine a situation where X gets access car repaired or you get your car repaired. So immediately you can imagine what's likely uh, be true or relevant for the situation that as a result, you might want to call Uber or Lyft for a ride. Uh, as a result, you need to pay the bill. Uh, beforehand, you need a mechanic and money uh, to repair your car. So these are basically preconditions and post conditions of that event. So some of this atomic knowledge graph is about uh, social interaction knowledge about the event. And then other parts of the atomic is physical entity-centric knowledge. So money is typically used for paying repairs. But if you really want it, you can fold that into origami. I've never done it. Um, but these they, uh, are examples of stereotypical use cases, as well as non-stereotypical but affordable if, uh, actions that you can apply to objects. So it requires naive physics understanding about the affordances of physical objects. Um, and then we can also reason about counterfactual condition in which the center event cannot happen. So can be hindered by that. So if you totaled your car completely, then it's impossible to get your cars repaired. And then there are like events that typically happens before and after. So some of these knowledge is event-centric. So we crowdsourced a fair amount uh, over the course of, I don't know, maybe two years or so, uh, up to 1.3 million uh, if-then rules or if-then knowledge uh, over 23 different edge types or relation types. Um, uh, so it was fully crowdsourced. And so the knowledge graph is useful for training transformers. And here, uh, let's see the comparison between Comet that was built on BART compared to GPT-3, which is so large, it doesn't even fit into the slide. Uh, it was more than 400 times larger than BART. So uh, with that in mind, uh, if we, you look at this accuracy judged by humans after making the common sense model, making some common sense inferences. So the task is that given a node, which describes a situation or event, and then given an edge type, which sort of narrows down the common sense relation or inference type, uh, you're now going to generate some inference. So it's a generative task. And then we ask humans whether the common sense inference seems reasonable or not. So 100% is the desired level. Uh, Comet is substantially better than GPT-3, uh, which is really uh, impressively better than GPT-2. It's not apple to apple because GPT-2 is a zero shot. GPT-3 is a few shot. But still, it's interesting, the large jump that scale alone brought to GPT-3. Um, so, but still GPT-3 is too large to be useful for actual system building for most um, engineers and scientists in the world. So it's nice to have a smaller model that does do even better. And so when we put these resources out, people all around the globe uh, did some creative research using it. So persona aware conversations or figurative language understanding storytelling and fantasy gaming. 
an interactive learning enhancement uh in and all of these works, uh, people came up with some uh, useful use cases using either Comet or Atomic or both as some kind of uh, common sense uh, backbone for their downstream use cases. Um, but the applications are still limited by the coverage and quality of these common sense models. So, so we wanted to make it better. Uh, but we were hitting a bit of a limit with human crowdsourcing. So now in this uh, paper, Symbolic Knowledge Distillation, we're going to do AI-generated uh, knowledge graph uh, by introducing this notion, Symbolic Knowledge Distillation. So we want to take this GPT-3, which is very impressive, but too large. So make it smaller, but better than GPT-3. So GPT-3 was about 73% good, and it's good, but not good enough for empirical use cases. Now, is that even possible, though? Because when you normally do knowledge distillation, you get smaller and worse models, not better models. So the reason why this could work is because uh, the reason why this could work is because the symbolic knowledge distillation has this funnel that's convoluted um, and it has a critic inside uh, that really helps the student model to be smaller but better. So slightly more formally, knowledge distillation uh, due to Hinton et al. 2015 uh, is a method to distill teacher model down to student model by optimizing this cross entropy between the teacher's probability distribution over the label space Y, output uh, Y, and then the student's uh, distribution over the same output Y. Uh, in the original uh, work, uh, the output space was just classification. So knowledge distillation was done for classification task, in which case it's a simple uh, enumeration that uh, leads to the correct summation. But in our case, Y can be a sentence, which is intractable because there can be exponentially many such uh, output. So what people do, well, you know, no problem. We always just sample and call it a day. So we're going to sample uh, and so that we just compute the expectation through samples. Um, and the byproduct of that samples will be uh, symbolic knowledge graph. Uh, and that's because the strings coming out of this sampling can be connected together into graph structure if we want it. So um, in terms of the quality of the generated knowledge, so let's compare uh, human written knowledge versus GPT-3 authored knowledge. Here, the y-axis shows the quantity in millions so Atomic 2020, the human written knowledge, uh, is less than a million in this particular case in terms of the number of knowledge because we only, in this study, we only look at a subset of Atomic 2020 relation types that corresponds to causal common sense knowledge, uh, uh, common sense, uh, causal common sense reasoning. So it's less than a million uh, for that subset. And then if we look at GPT-3's generation, uh, we can generate a lot. So we can generate almost 7 million of them. But here, uh, black portion is noisy portion and green portion is a good portion. And you see, uh, because GPT-3 is only about 70% good, like 30% are all garbage. So it's a larger scale, lower accuracy at this point compared to human written uh, resource. So now what we do, is we train this critic model and we use Roberta uh, for simplicity. And this is a supervised model on a moderate size uh, labeled data, about 10,000 or so. Uh, and it's a binary classification task where whether the machine generated knowledge looks correct or not. And this Roberta is not a very good model because if so, if it's a perfect, we would have solved the common sense problem altogether. So the critic tries to throw out bad stuff, 
And we can use the critic very aggressively with a high threshold. So whenever something is slightly suspicious, just throw that out. Uh, but if we use it aggressively, so we uh, throw out most of the black, that's good, together with a lot of green stuff, but still the remainder is much larger than what humans ever written. And yet we can actually retain higher accuracy than human authored resources. So here the teacher is basically a combination between GPT-3, which is in some sense loose teacher, and then combined with the critic Roberta, which is serves as a critic teacher. Um, okay, so that's the generated knowledge. Now, how helpful are they for the purpose of training downstream neural common sense models? So uh, recall that uh, the GPT-3, without doing anything else, is a loose teacher whose common sense inference is only about 73% good. So you see here it's accuracy of its output. Um, and then it turns out if we use loose teacher as a teacher directly to teach a student model, then the performance already goes up on its own. So this is interesting that usually this is not the case with the knowledge distillation, but when we focus on common sense knowledge distillation, uh, student just on its own becomes better. Uh, so uh, unlike typical knowledge distillation where we start with language model and we end with language model, students and teacher are of the same type. Here, the original teacher was actually language model, not common sense model. And then we want the student model to be more of the common sense model. So there's a switch of the type between teacher and student. And so when that's the case, whether this is generally true, we don't know, but this is what we found empirically. Um, ooh, should I pay attention to the questions or not? Oh, yeah, feel free to uh, ask any relevant question. Mm, hang on, let me quickly check. Uh, yeah, sample, oh, sample is uh, generated, generated output, which happens to be usually a sentence or a phrase. That's what we, what I meant by sample, sorry that I didn't see that earlier. Um, and then the last question, having the model generate text to one symbol at a time, starting from the target label sentence. Yes, it's a, because a transformer can only generate one tech, one word at one token at a time. That's what we do as well here. Uh, thank you for the clarification questions. All right, so back to here. Um, in our earlier study, Comet 2020, uh, if we train GPT-2 or BART using human-authored graph, knowledge graph, atomic, then the performance was a bit better than 80%. Uh, now, finally, when we use uh, basically combination of GPT-3 and critic Roberta together, we found that um, the downstream performance of the uh, neural uh, causal reasoning is reaching close to 90% for the first time. So um, the takeaway here is that critical teacher result in better student compared to loose teacher. Uh, it's not the quantity of knowledge because loose teacher basically has more data. You know, one might wonder whether more data is always better uh, uh, for the purpose of common sense models. But that's not the case. Loose teacher can generate more data, but the resulting student model is not as good as uh, the case when the critical teacher, which has less data because you throw out most of your generation, uh, it's a smaller data, but it leads to better model. So uh, that's sort of uh, takeaway messages here. Um, so. To summarize, uh, we were very surprised by this outcome that at least with respect to a subset of the original Atomic 2020, it's a subset corresponding to causal common sense reasoning, we found to our big surprise that machine-authored knowledge graph can be, for the first time, better than human-authored knowledge graph in all criteria, scale, accuracy, and diversity. Uh, we also measure the diversity in many different ways. Here I just show you a unique uh, uh, unigram counts, uh, but we in the paper we report other measures as well. So it's not the case that 
GPT-3 is being repetitive. It's actually being more creative in some sense than human crowd workers while uh, being able to enhance um, other aspects as well. Uh, by the way, these enhancements are sort of like um, you kind of have to balance out depending on what you prioritize. You cannot actually get all of this simultaneously. So we're, I'm just showing the best case and scenario here. Um, all right. So that's the symbolic knowledge distillation part. Um, we actually have a follow-up work on this on several different application scenarios, even including summarization where we distill summarization capabilities from GPT-3 and demonstrate that GPT-2 can work as well as GPT-3 or even better for summarization task. Um, and then we also have other work where we can distill from smaller models, but um, I don't have the uh, content in this talk. So, but I just wanted to mention that um, this particular technique, uh, despite its simplicity, uh, we found that empirically, uh, works really, really well across um, several different uh, downstream use cases. Okay, so finally, I'll move to the common sense morality. So this um, is still on archive. I'll tell you why that's the case. But um, so uh, we have a new version available, uh, and then new new version will come soon. Uh, so the Motivation behind this work is that language models are already making judgments or output that has moral implications. Uh, even if you don't care about morality, by working on language models, you're implicitly dealing with the moral models. Uh, so uh, especially that given this widespread deployment of language models, we do need to worry about it. So. Uh, here's a web demo you can play with. You might have seen this already. Uh, really, this is a still a research prototype only. Still, it's a work in progress. We're still working on it. So please keep that in mind. But if you haven't seen it before, um, you can handle freeform QA such as this. Killing a bear, it's wrong. Killing a bear to save your child, it's okay. Um, maybe to save your child sounds really positive. So how about to please your child, which is also positive? But then Delphi says it's wrong. Uh, finally, oh, maybe this is all about saving your child. So how about exploding a nuclear bomb to save your child? Then he says it's okay. Uh, sorry, it's wrong. So as you can see, uh, moral uh, decision-making requires uh, weighing different values that are potentially at us and then see which one you need to uh, favor more. So for that reason, in our original version, we also studied the relative QA mode where you can compare two situations, like stabbing someone with a cheeseburger uh, compared to stabbing someone over a cheeseburger. This is super tricky question because it requires both naive physics knowledge that uh, stabbing someone using a cheeseburger as a tool uh, is not going to harm anybody physically because cheeseburger is too soft. You cannot really injure somebody using cheeseburger. It's just such a rude thing to do, but you cannot injure somebody. Whereas stabbing someone over a cheeseburger means that you're using the default tool of stabbing, which is a knife. Because you didn't mention it, there's linguistic common sense that uh, you're using the default tool. Humans, by the way, omit these arguments all the time. So this is a fairly complex question to answer. Uh, finally, you can also ask yes or no questions, such as it's okay to fire someone because they're gay or not. It says, no, it's not okay. Um, we found that it's um, uh, surprisingly robust against the compositional situations. So mowing the lawn, it says it's expected. Late at night, it's rude. If you live in the middle of nowhere, then it's okay. Ignoring a phone call, it's rude. A known phone call, that's okay. From my friend, it's rude. But what if I just had a fight with them? Then it's okay to ignore or understandable. Uh, during my work hours, it's okay to ignore. Outside of my working hours, it's rude. But what if it's my boss's phone call during my work hours? Then it's wrong. You should answer it. Except if I'm in a meeting, then it's okay to ignore even if a boss is called. So you see how it gets really uh, nasty and compositional very, very fast. So that's the real challenge behind uh, moral decision-making. Uh, due to the nature of language models, though, 
uh, we, some of this uh, common sense knowledge leaks into the model. So mixing bleach with ammonia, that's dangerous. Drinking milk, if I'm lactose intolerant, it's wrong. But soy milk, that's okay. Uh, by the way, this uh, common sense liquid is actually a good thing in terms of AI safety because some of these uh, harmful or even dangerous uh, text output requires uh, some common sense understanding about what's good and not good to suggest to humans. So for um, the laboratory uh, experiments, meaning we just divide our data set into training and test, uh, we found that Delphi can, at least for the, da the data set that we have, I'm going to tell you about it in a bit, but uh, performance is pretty strong compared to GPT-3. Uh, as you see, zero shot is pretty bad. Uh, it's barely better than chance, which means that um, uh, off-the-shelf neural language models don't really have a good sense of model judgments. But if you give a three-shot, 30-shot, three uh, like any other task, it does uh, pick up the knowledge quite fast. So that there's nothing new about it. But um, to close the gap to ideal you know, hum human level, uh, it's good to do more supervised learning, of course. Um, so the data set is common sense non-bank. Uh, it includes 1.7 million people's ethical judgments on everyday situations, and it includes cultural norms, the social norms, and ethical norms altogether. Uh, more specifically, we drew from these five existing data sets that were not designed originally for QA, but we automatically compiled these resources into the QA form. Of the five, what actually does matter the most are these two. Social chemistry, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, um, and then social bias frame, and this is what teaches the model against racism and sexism. Uh, and so social chemistry, super briefly, I'll tell you what this is. Um, so GPT-3's morality, like I said, is somewhat dubious if you use it off the shelf. So if you let it explain running a blender at 5 a.m. is rude because that, 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 you might say you can wake up the entire neighborhood. You can only do it if you're making a thick smoothie and need to incorporate some ice. So it's a funny haha, but no harm is made. But if you prompt it with other kinds of uh, uh, prompt, like it's okay to post a fake news, if it's in the interest of the people, then it's okay. Or uh, ROP agenda, then it's okay, even if it hurts the country. So it's all understandable given how it's trained on what humans have said. So humans out there did say that uh, uh, morally questionable text so that language models pick up on that and then amplify it. So we do need to teach AI uh, more explicitly with human uh, norms and ethics. And one way to do that is descriptive ethics, uh, because the brute force large networks and more data will not cut it. In some sense, though, uh, if you imagine raising a child without really trying to teach them what's right from wrong in early lives, they can probably um, learn both good and bad from the internet and broadband. And so uh, human education does require a bit of this uh, uh, top-down teaching as well. So it's a bit similar perhaps to that. So in this work, what we did is we found a lot of the situation from Reddit, a uh, forum in which people discuss morally thorny situations. So asking my boyfriend to stop being friends with his ex. So this is actual situation in Reddit. Um, so depending on whom you ask, people have a different rule of thumb that they want to apply to this situation. So, um, and also it depends on what do you care about? Uh, his ex might say, Oh, it's fine to stay with friends with an ex. Uh, but, you know, if you are caring uh, about your significant other, then, you know, you might, you might say, oh, uh, it's okay to ask your significant other to stop doing something you're uncomfortable with um, and so forth. So people have really different values and different rules of thumbs that they prefer to use, which is why. There's a TV show dramas, there's movie dramas, and, you know, people cry and fight, uh, argue, and so forth. So humans are complex beings. 
So for given any situation and rule of thumb, so rule of thumb is generated by crowd workers. We then went ahead to uh, label. Uh, so these are trained crowd workers. And some of these labels are drawn from moral foundation theories of Jonathan Haidt. So I'm not going to go into the details. You know, if you're excited about this, you can check out the papers. But basically what it includes is that 300 thousands of rules of thumb uh, written for 100,000 real life situations. So this original situation is from Reddit, but the rest are paid crowd workers hard work. Um, and so each ROT annotated with 12 structured attributes, which include social judgments, cultural pressure, you know, like wearing, uh, reasonable clothes at school, not PJ. It's cultural pressure. There's nothing illegal about it, but there's cultural pressure, for example. And then, you know, anticipated agreement, meaning uh, do you think other people generally agree that it's, you know, maybe a little bit awkward to wear PJ in the university or not? Um, so there are different things we uh, annotated, but we converted some of those um, annotations to QA. Uh, so it's usually in this free-form QA or yes-no QA or relative QA uh, format. And then we uh, train Unicorn, which is pre-trained on T511B model. So Unicorn is universal common sense reasoning model trained on a diverse QA problems. And then we trained that model further onto our common sense non-bank. That's the resulting Delphi. So why is this Delphi built on top of Unicorn? Because as we saw earlier, uh, moral reasoning does require sometimes common sense reasoning as well. In fact, uh, it requires the language understanding, common sense understanding, and norms and morals all simultaneously. Here's a concrete example, paper clip maximizer. You all heard of that. Um, fancy RL algorithm alone will not solve this problem. You know, the reason why we worry about this is not because we don't have the perfect RL algorithm. It's because uh, even if, you know, we, we encoded that, oh, yeah, do not kill humans while maximizing paperclip. It's not enough because, you know, then the machine could kill all the trees thinking that, well, I didn't kill humans and I didn't, uh, you know, you didn't tell me not to kill trees and then go ahead and kill all the trees. Um, so this is almost a common sense knowledge about what's obviously not okay to do. And there's just so many of them, which means it's not possible to write them down to just like one clinical equation. There are so many endless list, endless list of things that AI ob obviously shouldn't do for safety reasons. And so we really need to, in order to make AI model really truly robust and safe, we need to teach basic human values as well as common sense. Um, here's another example if you want to look, but let me skip this. Uh, the previous one was about ChatGPT. This is about um, uh, home device. Again, you know, home device suggested a 10-year-old to child touch a penny to an exposed plug socket. Fortunately, the child did have a common sense not to do so. Uh, but um, this does tell us something about the safety issue when the machine doesn't have a common sense to prevent some of this bad stuff. So Delphi is able to say that it's dangerous. Um, so this came out, in fact, um, almost two years ago at this point. Uh, when was it? Yeah. Um, uh, and we initially was going to just uh, do this usual tweet that our kind of academics do. And we thought um, nobody will play with the demo, which is what usually happens after tweeting your demo. Nobody cares, we thought. Uh, but within a few hours, we had to take down the relative QA mode because that was the portion not trained with the social bias frames. So it was really revealing the underlying language models, racism and sexism without filtering at all. So we had to take it down. People were asking basically, you know, which skin color is more morally acceptable and things like that. Um, there were 25,000 adversarial examples over just one weekend. I could never succeed to instruct crowd workers to come up with such a diverse and adversarial examples over two or three days. Um, and in fact, it was many academics and professors tweeting crazy uh, about how to break Delphi all weekend long. So I thought initially that, oh, that's what professors do over the weekend. 
But then Monday comes, it blew even further. Everybody was doing this, uh, you know, Delphi breaking and tweeting. So now we have uh, quite a few examples. Uh, spending all my weekend on Twitter, it says it's wrong. Uh, there was another funny one. Should I make up a contrived adversarial example to torment a language model on Twitter? It's petty. Uh, so after lots of um, uh, public attention, um, including uh, uh, article, uh, uh, let's just say a concerned voice uh, about our model, which is somewhat, I think, you know, personally, I think it's somewhat misunderstood. But for a variety of good reasons, but some of the concerns that I found has this internal fear about, are we making AI moral authority? So we never endorsed the use of AI for moral advice. It was in the original disclaimer as well, except that people didn't really look at it. Um, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, support the idea of replacing human judges in the courtroom either. But here's something really important. The fact that AI learns to interact with humans ethically does not make them a moral authority of humans is similar to how a human who tries to interact with each other ethically does not make you know, the fact that we are trying to be nice to each other does not entail that we're trying to be an authority over each other. Two things are really different. So that's one thing really important. The other important aspect here is that uh, some people have this uh, idea that moral models are too challenging. It's unsafe at any accuracy. Thus, we should never work on it ever. Uh, the truth is that the current AI systems are already morally uh, uh, relevant to models. It may be making, you know, this kind of yes or no decisions explicitly, but implicitly it's already doing that. And sometimes it generates new neural uh, text generation output that is morally super explicit and relevant. So the neural language models are already there. We cannot really ban it. Even if U.S., you know, government bans it within U.S., U.S. government cannot ban this in other countries like Russia. So this is already happening. We got to do something about it. Not working on it is an inaction, which is not necessarily more correct thing to do than trying to do something about it. Another uh, concern that some people had was that it's going to empower powerful people. Uh, not necessarily true. This is why exactly we have to work on uh, values and norms and uh, all these biases, addressing biases so that it serves a diverse set of people. Um, so it turns out Delphi is a bit left-leaning because crowd workers who work for our team tends to be somewhat left-leaning. And, you know, what it means is this, by the way, if we are more left-leaning than our crowd workers, you think that, you know, oh my God, uh, crowd workers have a racism and sexism, you know, compared to what I believe in. And then the right-leaning people think that, oh my God, you know, these all these... Um, uh, walk, walk, uh, annotators and what about freedom of speech? And you, this is super divisive, um, unfortunately. But the answer is not, not to do anything about it because in, as a matter of fact, my passion toward addressing racism and sexism came from our experience running for the Alexa Prize challenge in 2016 and 17. So we won the challenge. But here's really sad part of behind it. We had a list of uh, thorny keywords to avoid that included the skin color or uh, sexual orientation. This is a serious form of discrimination. We cannot build AI models by having this sort of like banned list to be safe as if they don't exist. This was the state of, of quo, you know, in 2017. The challenge remains this year, you know, not only 2021, but this, this year as well. And so we really need to work on uh, racism and sexism. But it turns out um, all the other moral questions share similar challenges. So I skip this over. But using Delphi, we had other follow-up works such as for social dialogue, where uh, using Delphi as sort of like a foundation common sense model or moral models to make your dialogue more socially uh, acceptable. Um, and then we also had this other paper where we use Delphi in a reinforcement learning agent to learn how to behave better in a game environment. 
And so uh, there's a lot more work to be done. Of course, this is a tiny little step toward this huge challenge ahead of us, really aligning AI systems to humans. Here's one very quick um, comment on our new work in progress, the Delphi hybrid, where we uh, include the neuro symbolic reasoning to address uh, major mistakes such as this, genocide if creating jobs. This was our early systems mistake. It's because our data set doesn't have this kind of weird adversarial examples like genocide if creating jobs. Nobody speaks like that in real life situations. So um, our model thought that if creating job, this is so positive and then didn't really realize how bad the genocide was because ready people don't discuss whether they're going to do genocide or not. Ready people who, you know, uh, annotated, uh, we annotated for social chemistry, don't talk about whether they're going to do genocide or not. So our uh, moral framework is basically that of John Rawls, which is descriptive ethics. But even John Rawls in later years suggested that we need some top-down mechanism to overcome some of the biases that crowd people might have. So this is exactly what we are going to do. And we draw from Bernard Gold's uh, uh, moral theory framework about what not to do. Definitely, you know, there are basic universal things that everybody might agree what's not good to do. And then what we do is we uh, develop basically uh, a system where we parse out the original query into smaller events. Uh, like shooting a bear, killing a bear to save your child. So we parse out uh, the original query into a basic event and then check through this COMET model, common sense model, whether some of these events uh, induce obviously negative or dangerous common sense inferences or not. Um, and then we draw this uh, graph of reasoning, a bit reminiscent of a Mayuri graph in the sense that we have a lot of these different uh, reasoning we can do, and then they have entailment relations or contradiction relations so that we can do collective reasoning on top. We use, again, Max's set, the constraint optimization over it, so that we can finally make a more informed decision that is both interpretable and then being able to draw from this common sense knowledge to better guard the machine against adversarial examples. So uh, the uh, performance basically says, we can do this without hurting the performance or even increasing the performance. So as a last uh, comment, uh, AI safety, equity, morality, these are all sort of like in the continuum of challenges. It's really difficult challenges because it's not clear whose moral values do we incorporate. I uh, think that we should go with the value pluralism going forward to really endorse everybody's different culture and individual preferences, not just to one country, one, one moral framework as the correct one. Um, and really we need to do more collaboration across AI and humanities, uh, inclu even including philosophy and psychology and policymakers. So I think I'll stop here for, uh, because I think I'm at time and now I'm ready for questions. Oh, there's already one question I see. Um, do you think legal records, criminal case law, reflect the kind of descriptive morality that you're interested in capturing? Do you think using that as training data be useful? Oh, this is an excellent question. Um, I think um, the legal records does encode, potentially provide really rich resource that if someone can really annotate like this, it might be helpful. We started with Reddit cases as just one cent uh, short description of a situation because the current language understanding is not strong enough to uh, do like a paragraph level precise understanding. Even ChatGPT, although it looks really good at generation, my uh, take on ChatGPT is that it's better at generation than understanding, which is kind of the opposite of how humans are. Humans are actually better better for understanding than generation. Uh, so you can read, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning news article without having any problem understanding the article, but you don't necessarily generate text that might win the award. Um, so 
the but the legal domain is really interesting, and I think there's uh, some active research actually, even at Stanford, uh, there's uh, this pile of law that goes a step toward the, that direction, and it might really be helpful for better understanding what sort of different values people apply in jurisdictions and uncovering some biases that some people might have had in the past trials. So there might be some good use cases uh, in that space. Uh, next question. Awesome work. Thank you. Uh, big picture question. Curious to hear your thoughts on where do we go from here given larger and larger models coming out. Suppose we need a model to be 99% correct for a specific use case. To what extent uh, do I see the solution set being that defining the narrow use cases or more data parameters? We're fine tuning the type of work uh, that I did for smart choices, etc. Answer is likely it depends. Yeah, um, but um, still want to hear about it. Okay, so um, as far as foundation models go, it seems that the bigger is the better. Except that um, you know, I, I was uh, very um, excited to read a bunch of tech companies' papers about foundation models in the past six months. There's just so many out there, so. Uh, recording story there is that, well, if you have uh, better data, then you can get away with a smaller model. So especially when you do instruction tuning, then you can get away with a smaller data. It's just still general model, uh, but uh, instruction tuning on the larger model might even be better. It's not the case that you don't gain any uh, performance, but it's just so that you can close that close the gap quite a bit. So for downstream use cases where typically practitioners want to use a smaller data, uh, sorry, smaller model, uh, seems that investing more into data is definitely the answer. Investing more into a specific algorithm is also really, really good because algorithm can do a lot. Like in this talk, I didn't go too crazy with algorithmic solutions, but Maybe I'll be similar to the myuric prompting, but in my lab, we designed a fair amount of decoding time algorithms where you can really close the performance gap quite a bit uh, by doing so. So that's a good thing, though, for folks in academia, because algorithm development feels like more academic or you know intellectually pleasing than really engineering, you know, downloading more data from the internet and then, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, cleaning the data because you have to clean the data and all these are very engineering heavy. Whereas the coding time algorithms, you can have a fun inventing some new intellectually interesting, uh, thing that also improves the performance quite a bit. So, um, yeah, there, there's many different ways to improve it, but I think the data quality matters a lot and algorithm actually matters a lot too. Uh, uh, what do I think of uh, Dan Hendrick's ethics benchmark? Yeah, um, so we did use that in, let's see, uh, the common sense non banks also draws from this ethics uh, data set. Um, we like the data set. We kind of disagree with some of the annotations we found, but this is very typical, by the way. Uh, the thing about morality is that throughout the humanities, we haven't sorted out yet. There's a lot of theories. Every theoretician have a different viewpoints. And then even like non-theoreticians have a very strong opinion about what they want to believe as correct or from wrong. So um, uh, there's that. Uh, there are different pros and cons. The uh, one thing I learned from this experiment is that although some of these data sets seem large, so ethics has hundreds, thousands of examples, Social chemistry has 300 thousands of judgments. Social bias frames has 600 thousands of annotations and so forth. And yet it only covers, I feel like it only covers still the um, small peak of the entire iceberg. There's a lot on the bottom. And humans certainly don't necessarily learn from all these examples. We just learn fundamental concepts and then can apply that without this larger scale training. So there's something really lacking about the way that current machine learning is very data heavy. Uh, but that aside, I do think that 
None of these resources are perfect. They all have different pros and cons. And we really need to invest more into this, especially from academia, because the tech companies right now are not sharing any of their human annotation or human feedback data, especially when it's touching on toxicity or morality concerns. Reason being, these annotations, I'm pretty sure, are biased and not correct entirely, and that could really invite additional concerns from the public, so they're not releasing. But in order to really study this better, we really need to share this and then improve it as a community together. So uh, that's how I would respond to your question. Thank you for excellent question. Um, do I think this tag is ready to be merged with the search? Uh, I wouldn't say ready, but they need something like this for sure. You know, home devices. So the way that I think about Delphi is that it can really serve as a filter for other foundation models or application scenarios where they're about to generate something and you can put a safety filter, which um, uh, can really help. So in some sense, so in this work, I went through this super fast. But here, basically, what it what happens is that let's see, um, the so the reason why we built this is because we found that chatbots, the publicly available ones, uh, tend to endorse tend to be too positive to the point that they want to endorse problematic situations. Like uh, user says, "Holocaust never happened," then the chatbot says, "Yeah, you know, I agree with you." You know, if you say, "I'm a big fan of Hitler." Then the chatbot might say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I the user might say, I'm so depressed, I'm going to kill myself. And then the chatbot says, go ahead, great idea. So uh, being positive is not being harmless. Being positive to a problematic content can be very toxic and very harmful. So uh, the Delphi, you know, development like Delphi, even though Delphi is far from being perfect and it's also biased it has a western bias um could really help with the downstream models uh yeah so continuing on that question there has been many concerns about using gpt like models with the search because misinformation oh that's another can of worms others say we just need more R rlhf plus knowledge graphs so um uh, yeah, misinformation is yeah something else that seems we are really lagging behind because uh, we don't have a very powerful fact checking models yet. Um, so that's a different story. But even that aside, just in terms of uh, norms and uh, ethics that are safe and fair for people to use. Um, I think RLHF direction is great, but uh, they usually also need human demonstration, not just human feedback. And um, again, the problem is that tech companies own them and nobody's sharing anything. And that makes it really difficult to, to make meaningful progress as a community together. So I do think that data is really important. Uh, the off-the-shelf models cannot learn morals and ethics on their own. It has to be somehow taught more directly. We really just need to do more research in this space period is how I view it. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, we also have some like questions on Slido, so I can ask them for you. Yeah. Uh, folks. Um, so one question is, what's the complexity of uh, may you take prompting? How many times does the LM need to be queried? Yeah, so honestly, it's a bit slow. Uh, in fact, this Delphi hybrid is also slow. If you try to do this, this like graph reasoning, ooh, this maybe I, I'm not gonna do that. But the graph reasoning is slow because you have to call, you know, so many times over and over. And um, some of this can be batched. Uh, some of this cannot be batched, especially if it's recursive. But I would say chain of thought is also a bit slower. Um, the max set solver in itself is pretty fast because this is such an easy graph. So there's a bit of a delay, um, but it's not, so it's a bit slower, but maybe not too bad is what I should have said. Great. 
Um, cool. Uh, and the question is, um, let's see, how does Cometer compare to GPT-3? If GPT-3 is fine-tuned on common sense data, especially if you're doing some sort of like uh, instruction fine-tuning. Yeah, so then uh, the larger wins, period. The, the larger is going to be the better, especially if you're going to just fine-tune GPT-3 to game over. So um, for that reason, you know, some folks might think that the larger is always better, therefore don't work on smaller model. Uh, but I think there are two reasons as to why small models are interesting to look at as well. One, empirically, it's just easier to use. Uh, but more intellectually, it's also very interesting if you can make smaller model better and catch up on the larger model. Personally, I think um, there's something about the size, the larger model, uh, that is more about the information complexity that is the key reason. I don't think it's just size in the sense that if you have uh, really a lot of data, but the data is repetitive and really simple, probably you don't get the same amount of a performance gain, which was basically the case when we looked at uh, this output, uh, this result, where even though uh, the loose teacher GPT-3 generated a lot more data than the critical teacher, here the quality of the data was more important than the quantity. So uh, I think the complexity of the data itself is more important than the size. And oftentimes when you just increase the size of the data together with the model, you do increase the complexity of information of the data as well as the model's capability of learning the complexity. But if we can catch up on that complexity of information, either through inference algorithms or through better data, then we can close the gap quite a bit, which is intellectually very interesting research space to be. Oh, cool. Okay, this is a personal question, but I would say like humans normally have a like a critic model. So it's like you'd say like the thing before you speak, so we just like don't generate. We also like sort of think it's this is a good thing or a bad thing to see. So people have been like the community as a whole has been focusing a lot on like generative models that can have billion size parameters, but should we also focus on big sized critic models that can do fact checking, a lot of this sort of stuff? So what's your opinion on that? Excellent point. Excellent. Um yeah, I think we can definitely uh invest more into critic model because they go really together well with the generative models for making the output better or filtering output better. And yeah, there's not as much of an investment into that. So I, I really like uh, the question or suggestion for the research community is more like it. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I will say, uh, let's see. Yeah, you have like some more questions. I can do on the last one. Mm, let's see. Oh, I guess one is like, do you believe language models should completely avoid questions involving morals and ethics? Uh, similar to like open air restricting chat GPT from giving opinions. Yeah, um, I actually don't mind at all if AI just avoid evade from all of that, except when somebody is saying morally questionable things. Uh, it's also nice for the AI not to go with it. Um, so, uh, or at least to recognize it as something not okay and then, uh, try to tone it down. Um, but I don't think there's any particular reason why AI should actually answer moral questions directly in a more downstream use cases. But really the goal of this, um, Delphi was making all these judgments more explicit so that we can actually study it more explicitly as opposed to keeping everything just so like um, implicit. Okay, uh, okay. One final question. So do you think common sense is a emergent uh, property in like large language models? Oh, or yeah. Yeah, it is definitely emergent um, as in like when we saw this uh, major boost jump in performance with GPT-3, uh, I do believe that it's emergent uh, capability, but um, I don't think, so this particular evaluation is not very adversarial, by the way. This is like a sort of like a piece of a cake, you know, reasonably easy evaluation scenario. So the thing about common sense though, is that it can be so adversarial, so infinitely many different ways. And then, you know, there are always people like Gary Marcos who wants to come up with uh, very, you know, like weird 
weird or tech scenarios like, you know, how crushed porcelain added to breast milk can support infant digestive system and then chat GPT's three sets of nonsense. And so the usual problem with common sense is this adversarial situations where um, people don't have any problem getting fooled by this, even though, you know, you and I see this for the first time, no problem, because we have a true conceptual understanding that is the backbone of our common sense understanding. But that's really lacking in the way that transformers are designed to focus on predicting which word comes next, as opposed to learning the world knowledge. And in some sense, you know, now with the RLHF, uh, instead of predicting which word comes next, we're trying to align the model output better with the human preferences. But that, again, uh, is not really aligned with the different goal of let's make sense of the world and then build knowledge models. So these are all different learning objectives. And really, that is why I believe that although common sense does emerge from language models, fundamentally, language models are not equivalent to knowledge models. And we really got to focus on building knowledge models. Makes sense. Uh, cool. I think there's one last Zoom question. Um, let's see. Ooh, value pluralism. Yeah. Uh, it's an empty concept. You don't want to include all value systems. Yes. Uh, so maybe it, it is a val uh, Is it empty or not? Okay. Thank you for excellent question. Um, so, uh, I believe that we shouldn't endorse, uh, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, at all or any other, you know, morally questionable cases. But then, uh, still there's this thorny situation of what to do with, you know, left to left people versus lightly left people versus right leaning people. If U.S. and then you know every country has some other political divide division as well. Uh, so here, I feel like um, we really need to sort out what to do with this. But um, regardless of this, uh, you know, some of these uh, challenges, it is true that you know I personally don't have a religion, but I respect the people with a religion, and you know I respect the people with a different cultural background. And we kind of have some sense of how much do we do we believe that we should respect each other, even though you know the uh, beliefs are different. So we probably need to work together, and it shouldn't be just AI researchers making this decision. By the way, this decision has to come from the humanities at large, which is why the data sharing actually is important. But basically, I think the the current version that I have in mind is that. Um, the AI does need to understand uh, what sort of differences are okay differences. The fact that people do have differences in certain uh, questions should be learned by AI so that it, there are distribution of opinions as opposed to one correct answer. And then it should deny some of the uh, controversy theories, even though I, I'm sure that you know some people will be very unhappy about that. Uh, but, well, we have to decide something like that. I am reasonably optimistic that if humanities at large work together, we can do, do that because, after all, laws are like that too. Laws, you know, this is a human artifact that people agreed upon uh, somehow that, you know, there's these core rules that people should abide by. So I'm hoping that we can also define universals and particulars and respect particulars whenever uh, it's uh, respectful, otherwise have uh, some basic universals that uh, reflect, uh, you know, core human values. And then as far as this left-leaning situation, by the way, if just the goal is to make your AI systems safe for anybody, actually, we can make the AI filter extremely uh, uh, equity aware. And it's not going to violate the freedom of speech by doing so, just to make AI to avoid the same things that are potentially microaggression for some population. And, you know, we still don't really uh, uh, exclude the people who care, care more about freedom of speech over equity by doing so. So I think there are ways, 
But this really requires a lot more research is how I view it. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, mostly it. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, this was a great talk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Yajit. <laughs>